Good evening and welcome, Donna, to the Ken Keltner Badger State Chapter in warm, sunny Wisconsin. Well, well maybe not. Uh, <laughs> we've, we've got snow on the ground after living in Arizona for three years. I'm wondering what that white stuff is, but uh, I haven't sworn too much yet. So, so welcome. I, we appreciate your coming and joining us tonight. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Oh, it's, it's ours. Trust me. Let me do a quick introduction here. Uh, Donna Muscarella. Is that right? That is correct. Hey, uh, I, I can say a name like Dagenhart, but a good name that's really should follow easy. I struggle with. So mm -hmm. uh, Donna is a fourth generation baseball enthusiast, photographer, mixed media artist and baseball card collector. She attended her first professional baseball game at age two and a half. Vivid memories. Yes. Wow. wow. But was enthralled by the game even earlier. While Donna does not limit her photography to baseball, it is her most compelling subject. She has a passion for capturing its sights and shapes with her camera lens, using art to share her love of baseball with the world. Then in addition to that, Hinchcliffe, Hinge, 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 that place, stadium. I don't want to say Hinchcliffe yet. Uh, one of the few Negro League ballparks still standing is a repeat subject of Donna's artwork. In 2021, she released her debut custom trading card set, which combines her photography of the stadium with facts about the Negro, its Negro League ties and was featured in an article in the Sabre Baseball Card Research Committee blog. Uh, Donna's Hinchcliffe pho photography appeared in Forbes.com and the third edition of Turnstile, Sabre's Journal of Baseball Art. Uh, and it was recently requested by the Yes Network and is slated for inclusion in the Plan Museum at Hinchcliffe Stadium. So been very, very active. Uh, so welcome. Uh, I got a couple of questions. Uh, I like icebreakers. Uh, one of mine is kind of a typical that I, I use and other people have used, so I probably stole it from somebody. What is your earliest baseball memory? And it has to go before age two and a half, I think. Oh, sure. Yeah. My earliest baseball memory is, um, mm, okay, I'm not sure which of these came first, so I'm going to share both of them because they tie into the whole fourth generation thing. So every Sunday... Family tradition was get up Sunday morning, watch a little bit of TV, some Wonderama, some Flintstones, some Abbott and Costello, noon mass, and then to my great grandparents after. And I would walk in and there would be my great grandfather sitting in his chair, um, which I now have. We had it restored and I have the chair, which is very cool. Um, and it was for some strange reason in the corner of the dining room, but you know, when you don't have a lot of space in Brooklyn, things like that happen. Um, and he would have a little transistor radio bud in one ear and holding up a radio to the other ear and whatever games were on, that's what he was going to listen to. And so I would sit there and listen with him. Um, other than that, and, and I really don't know which came first, um, probably the one I'm about to tell now is sitting with my dad and listening to the radio and, you know, listening to ball games. And then on the rare occasion that they were on TV, sitting with him and having him teach me the game so that by the time I did go to my first game at two and a half, I understood the game. I knew where we were going. I knew what we were going for. I had a favorite player and it was Glorious. Oh, you're muted. Dennis, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry, guys, I've got a great grandson we're babysitting for and his Petri dish has been working. We both have a cold, so I started barking around here once in a while, so I'll be muting. So thank you, Donna. Um, kind of, a, this is not my other question, but a follow-up. At two and a half, you said you had a favorite player. Who is your favorite player? Bobby Mercer. Oh. I have a Bobby Mercer glove. Do you really? Okay, I just got goosebumps. <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah. It's a glove I grew up with, basically. Second question is, if, and this is one that I use in the newsletter all the time, if you could have a time machine moment, where or who would you like to go back to see? I feel like that question could have a different answer any day of the week. <laughs> Um, but for today, given where we're going, I am going to um, go with seeing Larry Doby play at Hinchlow Stadium. 
at, for the Newark Eagles. Or even a high school ball. I'm not yeah. going to be that picky. Right no, no, now. don't change it. Yet because <laughs> you're making me looking really like I'm really good at being able to do segues into presentations. Speaking of Larry Doby and Hinchcliffe Stadium, would you like to take over and run your presentation? Uh, if you have, yeah, if you have questions, please put them in chat. Uh, Donna has two parts uh, in her presentation. The first one will be on the stadium. Uh, we'll have a break. Uh, we'll take care of the questions then before we go to the other session, which is more free form and we don't have to do it the same way. So if you have questions, throw them in chat. Okay, Donna, it's all yours. Thank you. Okay, so before I get into uh, the photos and, and the history of the stadium, I just want to tell you a little bit about how and why Hinchliffe is important to me. Um, so I, as Dennis mentioned, I've been a baseball fan as long as I can remember, and I've been a card collector for almost as long. And along came the pandemic, and I had a very hard time getting my hands on baseball cards and wanted to feed my baseball hunger, my collecting hunger. So I decided that I was going to try and collect postcards of stadiums where Negro Leagues baseball had been played. I already had an interest in the Negro Leagues and already had an interest in baseball stadiums and baseball stadium postcards. And I thought that this would be a fun project that I could, you know, maybe on eBay or other uh, internet platforms be able to kind of feed the hunger. So I said, well, if I'm going to do that, I need to come up with a list of ballparks. And yes, we all know they played at you know, Comiskey and, and uh, Yankee Stadium and Fenway, and so, but I wanted Negro Leagues ballparks. So I did a Google search and thanks to the wonderful Google algorithm, it showed me on that list, Hinchliffe Stadium. And it said it was about 11 miles from my house. So I'm like, wait, 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 wait. And it's still there. I'm like, hold on a minute. So got in the car, went over. There's a, a little bit more to it in that the 100th anniversary of the Negro Leagues was in February of 2020. I wanted to participate in the Negro League Baseball Museum's Tip Your Cap campaign. Didn't have any place to get access to take an interesting photo and kind of scrapped that idea, right? So, okay, I'm gonna get in the car and I'm gonna go over to this Hinchliffe Stadium place. And I pulled up and I couldn't believe where it was. Now, I, as a photographer, I have visited the Patterson Great Falls numerous times to photograph the falls. And every single one of those times, it turns out that I was parked right next to Hinchliffe Stadium in what is now kind of the emergency parking lot for first responders and had no idea what I was parking next to. It was that run down and dilapidated and I... You could tell that it was a sports venue, but I didn't think that it was could possibly be anything of any significance because of the condition that it was in. So in um, early 2020, when I took the ride over there and I was approaching the ballpark, I saw a huge Larry Doby mural that had been painted the fall before. So I hadn't been there since the mural had been painted and it was just this rundown nondescript building and I could not believe that that's what I had been parking next to all those years and had no idea what it was so here I am walking around the place and just getting goosebumps on top of goosebumps thinking about what must have taken place there found a hole in a fence and crawled through and went inside and it was amazing um, it, it was mind blowing to see what had become of the place, but to also know what had happened there. So that kind of put me on this path to capture the place with my camera and to start telling the story of this amazing symbol of the American dream 
and one of the few Negro Leagues ballparks still standing. And uh, now, once again, not, there we go. Okay. So when people think of Alexander Hamilton and his ties to New Jersey, the first thing that will come to mind for most is his duel with Aaron Barr, which took place in Weehawken, New Jersey. And when most think of Hamilton and his contributions to our fledgling country, the Federalist Papers and his accomplishments as Secretary of the Treasury are likely foremost in thought. But did you know he also founded Patterson, New Jersey? He viewed the city's Great Falls and the power of the Passaic River as a tremendous energy source for the industrialization he believed was vital to the success of the United States. Patterson grew to be a manufacturing hub for silk fabrics, continuous rolls of paper, steam locomotives, airplane engines, and the first submarine. The city thrived. And in that thriving city was built one of the few Negro Leagues ballparks still standing. Pictured here on the left is the current Patterson City logo, which celebrates its roots in industrialization and its current focus on tourism centered around the beautiful Great Falls. The Alexander Hamilton mural, which was on an auxiliary building at Hinchliffe, right next to that Larry Doby mural that I mentioned, they were painted at the same time. And then two of my photos of the Great Falls. The design of Hinchliffe Stadium, named for the city's former mayor, John Hinchliffe, and mayor at the time, John V. Hinchliffe, was based on an Olmsted Brothers landscape engineering layout and the actual plans of Patterson architectural firm Fanning and Shaw. I mentioned the Olmsted Brothers because they played a role in the establishment of the National Park Service, a bit of trivia that ties into a Hinchliffe Stadium fact I will get to shortly. The site selected for the stadium was a bluff next to the Great Falls and included a piece of property formerly used by the Society for Useful Manufacturers, the organization founded by Alexander Hamilton as Patterson was industrialized. Pictured here on the left is a crowd gathered for a sporting event, a football game at the future site of Hinchliffe. And on the right is a Hinchliffe Stadium model for public view, sculpted by Gaetano Federici. And looking at that and seeing the ballpark now, it's like he did it after the fact. It That is what the ballpark, at least the, the structural elements, not so much the field anymore, looks like. The 10,000 seat stadium was built in the throes of the Great Depression. It opened to great fanfare in 1932. The inaugural events were a two-night portrayal of the life and career of George Washington in celebration of the 200th anniversary of his birth and a baseball game. The photo on the bottom right provides an excellent view of the field configuration. The ballpark played similarly to the polo grounds. That oval had dimensions of 279 down the left field line 258 down right and 483 to straightaway center. Hinchliffe was 280 down the lines and over 500 feet to dead center. Hinchliffe would go on to host the 1933 Colored Championship of the Nation and serve as the home field for the New York Black Yankees, the New York Cubans, and the Newark Eagles. Both Patterson and Hinchliffe had become representations of the American dream, but for very different reasons. Patterson's manufacturing dominance represented our country's successful independence and self-sufficiency through industrialization, while Hinchliffe showcased the talents of world-class black ball players who were told they had no place in professional baseball. Rather than quit, they founded their own professional leagues and thrived. In addition to hosting professional baseball games, Hinchliffe Stadium was the home field of Patterson Eastside High School. One of their star athletes, lettering in four sports, was Larry Doby. In May 1942, as a high school senior, Doby tried out at Hinchliffe for the Newark Eagles of the Negro National League. His performance and reputation led to his signing by Eagles owners Eb Effa and Abe Manley. 
Joby played for the Eagles in 1942 under the name Larry Walker to shield his identity and allow him to retain his amateur status so he could attend Long Island University on a basketball scholarship. From 1943 to early 1946, Doby served in the United States Navy. He returned to play for the Eagles after his honorable discharge. On July 4th, 1947, Larry Doby's contract was purchased by the Cleveland Indians. He went directly from playing for the Eagles to playing for the Indians, reintegrating the American League on July 5th, a little more than 11 weeks after Jackie Robinson made his debut for the Brooklyn Dodgers. And yet all too often, the story of baseball's early days of reintegration starts and ends with Jackie. Larry suffered the same indignities, received the same death threats, and was shunned by some of his teammates. Jackie Robinson deserves all the credit he gets, but Larry Doby doesn't get all the credit he deserves. And the photo on the right here is that Larry Doby mural that I told you about. Sadly, that mural, as well as the Alexander Hamil Hamilton mural next to it, were demolished during the restoration. That whole auxiliary building um, was taken down, and I'll talk a little bit later about what's in its place. At least 28 members of the Baseball Hall of Fame played at Hinchliffe Stadium. And I have this list broken down into three categories. The first column and the second column up to Jed Wilson lists players who played professional games in the Negro Leagues at Hinchliffe Stadium. Then there's Effa Manley and Alex Pompez, Effa Manley owning the Newark Eagles, who called Hinchliffe home, and Alex Pompez owning the New York Cubans, who also called Hinchliffe home. And that last column is members of the Hall of Fame who played either exhibition or barnstorming games at Hinchliffe. So again, 28 members known to date, perhaps more. A lot has been uncovered in just the past three years, and you never know what we might find out. You'll notice that Jackie Robinson is not on this list. While the application for Hinchliffe Stadium to be included in the National Register of Historic Places, which was prepared in 2003, includes mention of Robinson playing there in 1945 as a member of the Kansas City Monarchs, that claim has not been backed up by the extensive box box score research done since. Alex Pompez, with the help of his former New York Cuban shortstop Horatio Rabbit Martinez, constructed the initial talent pipeline from the Dominican Republic that brought Juan Marichal, the Alou brothers, and Manny Mota to Major League Baseball. So it's another cool tie back to Hinchliffe history. Hinchliffe Stadium was a popular venue for a plethora of entertainment, rodeos, wrestling, boxing, concerts, racing, soccer, and comedy shows all resulted in crowds heading to the stadium on the bluff. Tito Puente and Sly and the Family Stone performed at Hinchliffe. One of Duke Ellington's last concerts was held there. Babe Ruth visited Hinchliffe as a promoted guest for Diamond Gloves Amateur Boxing. There are stories of more celebrities, baseball and otherwise, visiting Hinchliffe as boxing spectators. And some pretty famous boxers fought there too, including Jake LaMotta and Rocky Graziano. Midget car racing was brought to Hinchliffe by Ed Otto, a founding member of NASCAR. Pro wrestling superstars Stu Hart, Gorgeous George, Chief J Strongbow, Jimmy Valiant, and Gorilla Monsoon all had matches at Hinchliffe. Jim Thorpe played baseball at Hinchliffe with his, his barnstorming Oakland Indians. Comedy one-liner, Master Henny Youngman performed at Hinchliffe, as did Abbott and Costello several times in Lou Costello's hometown stadium. It's wonderful to imagine people sitting in the stands and roaring with laughter as who's on first rolled off of Bud and Lou's tongues. A side note, while the performance shown here is not something recorded or, or captured on film at Hinchliffe, it's rather from the movie, The Naughty 90s, you'll notice a nod to Patterson appears in the scene's backdrop. 
Eventually, Hinchliffe Stadium came under the ownership of the Patterson Board of Education, and the city was on the decline. By 1983, Patterson was ranked as the fifth poorest city in the United States. Despite Hinchliffe's rich history, the stadium fell into disrepair. In 1996, it was deemed unsafe and closed. Things got worse from there as vagrants and vandals became frequent visitors. Empty liquor containers, spray paint cans, and more littered the place that had once been the pride of Patterson. On September 17, 2002, the 70th anniversary of the stadium's official dedication, Friends of Hinchliffe Stadium was founded by Flavia Alea and Brian Lapinto. And here's a quote from the Friends. Where others see a weed overgrown concrete oval, it stands scrawled with graffiti. We see a key to unlocking one of the most vivid, creative, and inspiring American stories of several generations. End quote. The organization worked tirelessly to save Hinchliffe, which was deteriorating more by the day and headed for demolition. Through Lupinto's and the Friends' efforts, the stadium was declared a National Historic Landmark, a Patterson Historic Landmark, and part of Patterson's Great Falls National Park. It is the only baseball stadium part of our nation's national park system. These declarations helped refocus a Patterson on the rise, one that is promoting tourism, entertainment, arts, and culture. These are some of my photos taken in the months before it was announced that the stadium was going to be restored. We did not know that was happening. There have been many, many false starts, many rumors, many promises, and nothing ever happened. So I was just capturing history as it was. I had no choice. This is what it was. This is what I photographed. Um, the photo on the left there was taken from the window of that press box that you see there on the top right. Um, the one in the middle on the bottom is looking from outside the stadium into what was the locker rooms. And the other is just um, part of the concourse. You can see there were trees growing up from the stands. And um, I have photos of what the inside of that press box looked like. There was a mattress in there. There were clothing, syringes, all sorts of stuff. And, and not just in the press box, all over the stadium. Um, it was quite sad. It was very, very bizarre for me to be walking around there knowing what it was and what it was home to um, and seeing this is what it had become. But it gets better. In February of 2021, Patterson's Mayor Andre Sayer received word that tax credits had been awarded for the restoration of Hinchliffe Stadium. A groundbreaking ceremony was held inside the dilapidated landmark on April 14, 2021. The date was chosen because Larry Doby wore number 14. The restoration initiative would include the building of a 55 and over housing complex and a parking structure next to the stadium. And these are some of my photos from the day. On the left is um, are some of the ceremonial shovels. The handles were in the shapes of bats, and then we had the gold shovels at the bottom. Harold Reynolds, who had for a long time fought to bring attention to Hinchliffe, and he was named an ambassador of Hinchliffe Stadium. Uh, in the bottom center is uh, the ceremonial groundbreaking. Nobody actually broke into the asphalt. They brought in a pile of of uh, potting soil, dumped it there, and this is what we did. And then on the right there, that's Larry Doby Jr., who I had uh, the opportunity to talk with quite a bit after the ceremony, and he was nice enough to pose for a photo for me. In the midst of the restoration, which ran approximately $10 million over the $94 million budget announced in 2021, News broke that Hinchliffe would be the new home for the New Jersey Jackals of the Independent Frontier League, an MLB professional partner league. And here are um, some of my photos taken during 
the restoration. I became friendly with um, the foreman there and he was nice enough to let me onto the construction site um, to get some of these photos. The one on the top right is um, on the exterior where they were doing some uh, structural repairs and everything else is inside um, the ballpark. That inset photo on the left side of the screen there is the 55 and older housing facility. And just beyond that is the parking structure. Um, that photo on the bottom left, um, that building behind it is, at, is uh, Patterson Public School number five. So the institution that owned the stadium had a prime view of watching it crumble every day and still chose to do nothing about it. So um, the next couple of slides are um, of some of my photos of pre and post restoration. Um, you'll see that the uh, the nameplate over the stadium entrance there was in rather bad shape and being held up by supports. Um, there were three nameplates or four entrances uh, at the, the uh, towers into the stadium. Three of those four entrances had the nameplates above them. Two of them were saved, um, and you'll see one of them in some of the photos later. Uh, one was demolished, and Friends of Hinchliffe Stadium was actually able to get some of the pieces of that. And the fourth entrance just had a concrete slab above it. And then on the right, um, you can see the, uh, the new and improved version. Um, yes, there are metal detectors at the stadium now, unfortunately. Um, it's the norm but I'd rather that than what's on the left. And those ticket booths are just absolutely beautiful. The tile work on them is stunning. It was actually one of the few things that was still in very good condition um, and wasn't crumbling. Um, and now that everything surrounding it has been repaired, they look so much better. So these are two shots taken from almost the same vantage point. Um, you can see, unfortunately, that the baseball diamond orientation is similar to what you see in that photo on the left and not, which was what was put in um, when it was solely high school ball being played there. They made that change then. Um, and not the Negro Leagues configuration that you saw in the photo earlier. Um, it's awkward, but it's better than a wrecking ball, so I'll take it. These are some photos of the stands um, before, during, and after. You'd see that they are still straight backless bleachers, and the reason that was done is because it is a historic landmark, and there was only so much they were allowed to do to change the structural elements so um, bleachers it is, which while it can be a little uncomfortable at times, it's kind of cool to know that I'm seeing it the same way and sitting the same way that people did when they saw those 28 Hall of Famers there. These two photos of scoreboard this, with the Patterson skyline beyond it. Um, the scoreboard on the left obviously is not a baseball scoreboard that was put in there much later, but they're proximity wise close to each other. Um, you can see in the photo on the right that all of those trees have been uh, cut down and you have a clear view of that Patterson skyline. So here's some photos of the place back in action. Before I get to those, I'll tell you a little bit about the logo that's on the left there. That is the new Hinchliffe Stadium logo. There's a couple of interesting, cool components to it. Uh, you've got the Patterson skyline in the background there with the churches and the smokestacks. That uh, lighter red oval is meant to represent the shape of the field. Uh, you see that those towers with the terracotta tile on top, 
By the way, the terracotta tiles that did need to be replaced as part of the restoration were gotten from the same company that provided them back in 1932. Um, and then the Hinchliffe Stadium wording there is a uh, replica of the wording that's on those nameplates that are over the stadium entrances. So the photos that you see on the right here are from opening day, May 18th, 2023. So the first baseball games played at post-restoration Hinchliffe were part of the Silk City Baseball Classic. It was a double header. The first game of the day was Patterson Eastside, Larry Doby's alma mater, versus Don Bosco, which is a pretty big baseball school in New Jersey. Um, and then the second game was Kennedy versus Patterson Science. These photos are all from the first game. That's a Bosco uh, player on the left there, east side on the right. And that photo on the bottom, I like to point out how while the players had arrived and were doing their pregame warmups, the uh, stadium maintenance crew was putting together the, uh, still putting together the outfield fence and, and tying down those advertisements just before start of game. So uh, here we've got on the left, the ribbon cutting, which took place the day after the Silk City Baseball Classic. Uh, that is uh, Mayor Andre Seya in the center there holding up the scissors. Uh, he's surrounded by some uh, Patterson employees and dignitaries. Um, in attendance that day were um, people the likes of Willie Randolph, Harold Reynolds, Joe Madden, and Whoopi Goldberg. And the photo on the right is from Jackal's opening day, the return of professional baseball to Hinchliffe Stadium. That was on May 21st. It was supposed to happen on the 20th, but got rained out. Um, and pictured there is uh, the first of the three ceremonial first pitches being thrown out by Willie Randolph. The second one was thrown out by Assemblyman Benji Wimberly, who's on the right side of that photo. And then that's Mayor Saya standing on the top of the mound there. And here we go, professional baseball at Hinchliffe. Photo on the top right is Vin Mazzaro throwing out the first pitch of the game. On the bottom left is James Nelson, who went on to be the 2023 MVP of the Frontier League. And then that inset photo there is Dylan Castaneda from a different game. Um, I chose to include that photo because I absolutely love those red Silk City uniforms. Um, Silk City is Patterson's nickname. And those uniforms have that Hinchliffe Stadium logo that I showed you a little earlier on the sleeve. And they are, I just love them. So here's a, a, a wide angle shot of the stadium taken opening day. And you'll see in, in what center field that building beyond the stands is what replaced that auxiliary building that had the Dobie and Hamilton murals on them. That building is going to ho house a food court on the first floor and the Charles J. Muth Museum of Hinchliffe Stadium on the second floor. That museum is going to be dedicated to telling the story of Hinchliffe Stadium and the Negro Leagues and the Civil Rights Movement. The latest estimation is that the stadium, uh, the museum will be opening this February, um, but that's the third date that I've heard. And to be honest, the space is not built out yet. I know that they are uh, working on the exhibits and curating all of the content for the museum, but they haven't been able to actually get in there and do anything yet. It's still just um, steel beams and, and a very raw space right now. You'll notice I mentioned before about the repositioning of the diamond. Um, so there's a, uh, a netting that you see that the, the uh, right field foul pole um, and with that really high netting, it's not unusual for balls to be hit not only over that netting, but over the stadium wall and onto the street. So if you ever come here, don't park on Maple Street. You may lose your windshield. The uh, 
baseball community at large and not just the New Jersey Jackals and, and the city of Patterson has um, really embraced Hinchliffe and its history and is doing a lot to help promote what the stadium stands for. Many of these photos were taken by me on Juneteenth. There was a two-day celebration spearheaded by the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. They took Larry Doby's plaque from the plaque gallery at the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown and brought it to Patterson. It's very, very rare that a plaque leaves the gallery. Um, usually a plaque will leave the gallery once right after a player is inducted. Um, and very rarely other than that does, does one leave. So uh, a little paper replica went up in place of the plaque and the plaque came to Patterson along with um, several members of the Hall of Fame's education department and Josh Rawich, president of the Hall of Fame. The first day's festivities consisted of three separate events. The first was um, a little pep talk and history lesson by Josh to a large group of students told them about Larry Doby, about the history of the ballpark, about the civil rights movement. That was followed by a play ball clinic where there were five stations set up and the kids got to um, learn how to hit off of a tee, learn how to catch, learn how to field ground balls, learn how to run the bases. And each of those stations was uh, staffed by volunteers as well as volunteers from play ball, MLB play ball, as well as volunteers from the New Jersey Jackals who had just returned very early that morning from a 14 hour bus trip and thought it was important to be there for those kids. Totally voluntary and went ahead and did it. And it was absolutely wonderful to witness. Um, the Then there was a press conference um, and that photo on the top right, uh, sorry, top left there is from post press conference. And the purpose of the press conference was to bring attention to Larry Doby and his contributions to the game, as well as the broader story of the Negro Leagues and to announce the name of the new Negro Leagues exhibit that is opening um, Last I was told, Memorial Day weekend in conjunction with Hall of Fame Classic weekend in Cooperstown. Um, and that Negro Leagues exhibit is going to be called The Souls of the Game, Voices of Black Baseball. That name was announced during the press conference, as well as some detailed information regarding the Hall of Fame's Black Baseball Initiative and the efforts to bring teachings about black baseball and baseball in general into the classroom. So the following day, um, there was a 10.30 a.m. game and attended by 98% students and teachers. So the education department had a hands-on exhibit set up on the concourse. They handed out baseball cards to kind of get the kids' attention. And then they came over to the table and were able to hold an Adam Jones game used uh, jersey or a, a game used bat, sorry. Um, and see a Larry Doby model jersey, a Satchel Page model jersey, um, put on a baseball glove, wear a vintage catcher's mitt, see a baseball that was cut in half so they could see what the inside of it was. That photo on the bottom right there shows a little bit of that interaction. Um, the photo on the bottom left is Larry Doby Jr. with his dad's plaque. Um, he was absolutely beaming that day, and it was great to be able to capture that photo. The photo in the center here is from another one of the uh, efforts to highlight the history of the stadium and the Negro Leagues. And that was taken on July 5th, 2023, Larry Doby Day. The Frontier League made a point of making sure that the Jackals would be home on Larry Doby Day, the day that he reintegrated the American League with the Cleveland Indians, and the entire team wore number 14, Newark, uh, Newark Eagles jerseys. Um, the jersey that I'm actually wearing tonight 
is the jersey that was worn by Keon Barnum, who's the player, the leftmost number 14 in the photo. Um, and when I will say when the plaque was set up there on the field earlier in the day, there was a constant stream of players coming out, reading the plaque, asking me and some of the other people who were down on the field um, to tell them about some of the history and the significance. And while the players that are there know that it's a historic ballpark, they don't know a lot and they want to learn about the specifics of that history. Hinchliffe is a multi-purpose facility. In addition to baseball, track and field, soccer, boxing, wrestling, and cricket. But the biggest non-baseball event or events at Hinchliffe certainly uh, are football related. Uh, the two photos on the left are of the Zone 6 uh, football showcase. It was a two-day event, September 1st and 2nd. Um, that was the first time football was back at Hinchliffe. It was two games on September 1st. So there's photos there from um, the first game and from uh, it's between games when it was just starting to get dark. Um, just to give you a sense of the layout in that photo with the goalpost on the top left there, where the goalpost stands is just about where home plate was with the Negro Leagues configuration of the stadium. Uh, the four photos on the right are from the Turkey Bowl, uh, which took place on Thanksgiving morning. It is a 99 year old Patterson tradition. The game always takes place between Patterson Eastside, Dobie's alma mater, and Central High School, which was renamed to John F. Kennedy High School. And this year it was back at Hinchliffe for the first time in 26 years. So it was a, a wonderful event. Um, you heard things like, this is better than college homecoming. It's a family reunion. The families were pumped. There was so there were lots of alumni there. Um, the stands were not as packed as we had hoped they would be, but this is a work in progress, and I, I think good things are are coming. Um, you'll notice in that photo in the top center there. Um, since the end of the baseball season, they added that Hinchliffe Stadium lettering over the scoreboard, um, and another thing that they did uh, that day and, and they've been trying to do throughout the season is not just say, hey, here's what's happening here now, but talk about the history of the stadium and all throughout the game. Um, they had slideshows running, showing photos and telling stories about the previous games, the previous Turkey Bowl games at Hinchliffe. Uh, Patterson Eastside, who I was rooting for, won 24-7. And I was very happy. In closing this portion of my presentation, I'd like to thank all of you for being with me for this portion of my public Hinchliffe Stadium journey. It's a journey that began with the release and sale of my custom trading card set and continues as I use opportunities such as this to help preserve and promote the history of Hinchliffe Stadium and the Negro Leagues, both national treasures. So if anybody's got any questions, uh, I'm happy to take them. The Olmsteads you mentioned, um, and anybody who watches Seinfeld knows that Central Park was designed by Joe Pepitone, but <laughs> uh, the ones you mentioned, that's, is that the Olmstead with Central Park, Prospect yes, Park? it is. It is. I just want to say it was a fantastic presentation. I mean, just the photographs and the history and everything. Thank you so, very much. Yeah. Thank you. I like, I just like the personal journey you have with that. I always love hearing about that. I mean, just from the fact that you parked there and didn't know it and 
yeah. how it became special to you. And and that's really, that is what made me so passionate about this, that already being a baseball fan, already being someone really interested and invested in the Negro League's history and, and the story and the players, and knowing that I was right there, and it was something so, the, the what it stood for was all stuff that was so near and dear to me, and I had no idea. And if I'm right there, and this is already stuff that's in my wheelhouse, and I didn't know how many other people didn't know. And these are stories that need to be told. And so I'm just, you know, I, I, you do not need to twist my arm to get me to go somewhere with my camera. So this is just a perfect storm of, of being able to tell the story of, of all of these players and this place. I mean, look, it, people will debate how many Negro Leagues ballparks are still standing, so I don't like to attach a number to it, right? But there's Rickwood and there's Hamtramck and there's Hinchliffe. Um, there's a piece of League Park still standing. Um, but this, this in its entirety, this is the place. It, aside from the changing of the field configuration, the walls are the walls and the stands are the stands and, and the ticket windows are the ticket windows. And, and yes, they plowed, you know, they, they they paved over the grass and they changed the field configuration, but it's it's still, you know, the, the to, to steal a, a Yankee stadium term, the mystique and the aura is still there. It's still the same place. I, I had the great fortune of attending a game at Hinchliffe with Donna. And um, we were sitting there and thinking, yeah, Josh Gibson, you know, all these greats played there. And just the Larry Doby, just the Larry Doby story. Yeah. Is enough. We, yeah. We yeah. sat, the, the way that the field is, is set up, um, there's all that seating um, in the bowl there, but they also have four tables and chairs down mm -hmm. on the field. Um, and that's where I always am as, as a credentialed member of the media. Um, there, there is there is a press box, but it's really tiny and it's not positioned wonderfully for me to get the kind of photos that I want to get. Um, so there, there's netting there and there's some holes in the netting that I can get my camera through or I don't necessarily need to get it through, but. I do. Um, but that's where I like to hang. Um, it's right next to, we'll use the term loosely, the dugout. Um, the dugouts are are tents with really low ceilings to them. <laughs> I, I'm five feet tall and I feel scrunched when I'm in there. I can only imagine what these six foot, you know, six foot two, six foot four guys feel like when they're walking in there. Um, but we sat at one of those tables down on the field for the game. And it's really not that far from where home plate was and where the original dugouts were. And Mary was sitting there, she's like, you know, Josh Giberson probably walked right where we're sitting right now. And I was like, yeah, he did. And it's just, it, when you think about that, it's really, and, and that that's where Larry Doby came from. And let's think what Larry Doby stands for, right? That happened there. If there is no hinge lift, I don't know. Is there a Larry Doby? I mean, maybe they would have seen him someplace else. But how many other high school teams had a, a, a standing stadium like that? That's that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> when you sit at right, those so tables, those... when you sit at those tables, isn't it hard to see down the first baseline? It's. I don't know, Mary, what did you think? Yeah, you know, so so some of the sight lines are compromised, sitting on those really cool seats, but you're down on the field and that's a really cool experience in itself. We we had the option of going up to the seats. Like, I think, yeah, I think we did that a little bit. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, and went up to the concourse to, to get food and stuff and walked yeah. around a little bit. Yeah. I mean, it it's... 
you know, one of it, it's it's a blessing and a curse right now in that um, the games are not sold out, so you can really pretty easily wander the stadium and check it out from a lot of different angles. Um, getting down on the field, it, unless you have to either be to, even to get to those tables, you either have to have a ticket for those tables or be credentialed, and so. Um, but it's it's. It's cool to be down there. I've gone and sat up in the stands too, like, you know, sometimes, but it's it's cool to be down there. Yeah, I tried to get all the different vantage points. I was just geeking out there. It was yeah. just fantastic. Yeah. And, um, I, I, you know, some people are afraid of Patterson. I, I think my view of it is Patterson hit is has so much potential. If they would just get, like, like train service from New York to Patterson, there's such a how you know yeah. affordable housing shortage in New York that I think Patterson would benefit from that, and I'm hoping for better things for Patterson. By the way, anyone who has seen the Milwaukee Milkmen, Keon Barnum played for the Milkmen here. I don't know if anybody has gone. Yeah, so and I didn't Keon know Barnum's know. jersey. That's the jersey that I'm wearing. It's Keon that's Barnum's so cool. jersey. Yeah, and he he hit a walk off home run for us. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. If I remember correctly, I think Keon was named, he may have been named the MVP of the All-Star Game. He was something for the All-Star Game, and I believe he also led the league in home runs. I can believe it, yeah. What is the neighborhood like now? Are there any significant crime or transportation issues? Uh, transportation is an issue. Um, there is bus service close to the stadium. Um, parking, there is a parking structure. So people say, oh, parking is difficult. What's difficult about the parking, and I want to preface what I'm about to say with um, the fact that for all the shortcomings that I'm about to mention, I will take it all over a wrecking ball any day of the week. I cannot stress that enough. Um, so they knew that parking was going to be an issue. It is in a residential neighborhood, right? There's the school right across the street and it's houses and, you know, some small shops along one street there. You are right next to the Great Falls. There's a parking lot at the Great Falls that is within walking distance of the stadium, but they did build a parking structure there. Um, and there is a second one about to be built. I also learned the other day that they are opening a river walk down next to the falls this June. Um, so the, the issue with the parking is that the city, they're kind of talking at both sides of their mouths. So they say, come to Hinchliff, come to Hinchliff, come to Hinchliff, but pay $15 to park. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem for people because, and it has nothing to do with, that's, that's not a knock on Patterson. I had a conversation last year with Bobby Jones, who was the team general manager last year. And I'm going to take him at his word on this. There are only three professional minor slash independent league teams in the entire United States that charge the same or more than Patterson is charging to park for a ball game. A lot of stadiums, it's free or it's $5. $15 to pay and then $15 per ticket and $8 for a hot dog or a hamburger that isn't even as good as the goop you get at McDonald's. I mean, look, it wasn't a horrible hamburger, but it's not a $15 hamburger. And that's part of the problem. Um, in terms of crime, is Patterson the safest place in the world? No. Have I ever hesitated to park my car on the street there and walk to the ballpark? No. When I'm inside the ballpark, am I scared? No. Um, there are certain other parts of Patterson that are a lot more questionable. I mean, it's 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 an inner city, right? And but it's it's I'm not, I'm not scared. I wouldn't I wouldn't say don't go there. By no stretch would I say don't go there. Um, but um, hey, guys, 
I don't know if you can hear me. I'm signed out twice. My laptop is completely frozen. No clue. Can't change anything. Uh, Donna, do you want to stop sharing your screen to see if that does it? Sure. Absolutely. Okay, now I I see you moving from both from both of your connections. Yeah. <laughs> both cameras are picking me up, yeah. but yeah, I'm not yeah. sure what. Uh... Double trouble. Mm -hmm. yes. Anna, uh, is uh, is Larry Doby Jr. still in the area in Patterson? I don't know if you mentioned that. And and does he have like a foundation or an organization to promote his uh, father's legacy at all? Um, Larry Doby Jr. lives in Montclair now. So um, just an interesting tie in to um, something else that's relatively close to Hinchliffe Stadium, which is the Yogi Berra Museum and Learning Center. Um, Larry Doby became very, very close friends with Yogi Berra, so much so that he moved to Montclair, which is where Larry, uh, Yogi and Carmen <coughs> Berra adopted Montclair as their hometown. And that's where they lived until um, they moved into assisted living very close to Montclair. And um, the Museum and Learning Center is on the campus of Montclair State University. Technically, geographically, it's in Great Falls, but it's Montclair. Um, so Larry Doby Jr. is living in Montclair. He's close to Patterson. Um, he works as um, part of Billy Joel's stage crew. Um, so that's, that's what he, that's his gig, but he does not officially have a foundation, um, to promote his father's legacy. Um, but he does make his presence known as his work schedule allows. You saw he was at the groundbreaking. He was at the Larry Doby, uh, Juneteenth celebration. He unfortunately was not at Larry Doby day because, of a conflict with Billy Joel's performing, um, but he is, he's there as he can be. He's also involved with the planning for the museum. Yeah. That's Thank gonna you. be at Hitchcock. Okay. Any other questions? No, okay. So I'm going to, if everybody's okay with this, I'm going to move into the second part of my presentation. So what you see here um, are my uh, trading cards. It was a four trading card set that I created and uh, Dennis mentioned um, in my introduction uh, that were created and released in uh, early 2021, still during the 100th anniversary celebration of the Negro Leagues. And this was, even though I've been taking pictures for a very long time, I, I would show them to friends and family, but I never really went public with things. And this was my foray into uh, going public with things. And so I, uh, launched i released this set um at, in a limited edition of 50. um i do still have a few available that's not a sales pitch it's just commentary um and i sold the, the ones that i sold a portion of the sales went to different organizations that help promote and preserve negro leagues history so some of the money went to um the negro leagues baseball museum some of the money went to the uh, Negro Leagues Committee of Sabre and the rest of the money from um, since that last donation through um, when the set sells out um, will go to the Charles J. Muth Museum of Hinchliffe. Um, so this was well received and it kind of gave me the courage to start doing some other things with my photography. So I create um, one of a kind pieces of mixed media artwork 
that combine my original photography and hand cut Allen and Ginter baseball cards. So um, it kind of brings a couple of my loves together. My love of baseball, my love of baseball cards, my love of Allen and Ginter baseball cards, my love of collecting. So each of these pieces, as I mentioned, are one of a kind. They range in size from four by six to, um, I think the biggest that I've done is about eight by 12. Most of them are five by sevens or eight by tens. Um, and what I do is um, I select, once we know what the subject is gonna be, either something that I choose to create on my own or something that I'm commissioned to create. Um, I find an Allen and Ginter card that works with the subject. I find a photo that works well with the card. I hand cut the baseball card with uh, different knives. And then I create a digital background that complements the photo and the card. That digital overlay gets professionally printed uh, on the photo and then professionally dry mounted. And then I adhere the card on top of that print. Um, so on the left here is uh, a Larry Doby piece that um, shows the Larry Doby statue at Larry Doby Field. <laughs> and then on the right is a piece that Mary commissioned me to make um, that shows Hinchliffe Stadium pre-restoration with Larry Doby. And I call that piece uh, my Beacon of Hope edition. And it kind of talks about you know it talks to what that stadium stood for and stands for and what larry doby stood for and stands for uh, people in patterson very much were like hey if if larry doby can make it i can make it and and not just in the context of baseball just somebody from patterson was able to make it um so it stands for for a lot of different things um this slide shows some of my different um Im different pieces that feature photos of players um and because uh, every one of these photos is mine um taken mostly at ball games that photo on the top left there was taken at the uh parade the night before Hall of Fame induction, the year that David Ortiz was inducted into the hall. So that was uh, 2022. Um, then we've got Ronald Acuna Jr. Uh, going counterclockwise, Mariano Rivera, Shohei Otani, Aaron Judge, Francisco Lindor, and Joey Votto, um, taken in various places at various points in time. These are some um, different twists on baseball art. The three on the left are from what I call my nickname series. So we've got the Hawk, Andre Dawson. Um, that photo, funny enough, that Hawk photo was captured in my backyard Christmas morning last year. I had been wanting to do a an Andre Dawson Hawk piece for uh, really since I started doing this. And wasn't able to get a good hawk photo and then Christmas morning I was looking out my bathroom window and there was a hawk and you never saw somebody run so fast <laughs> through the house so like Christmas morning people were like what's going on <laughs> so managed to get that photo as well as um, a bunch of others then we have rhino and uh, Pete Alonzo polar bear um, so that's three for my nickname series and then the one on the right there was a commissioned piece from a gentleman who collects things related to baseball mascots. And he asked me if I could do something for the Minnesota Twins TC Bear. And I said, as long as there's an Allen and Ginter that works with it, absolutely. And Allen and Ginter had done two uh, insert sets of two subsets of cards, one called Mascots in the Wild, and one called Mascots in Real Life. And this was uh, the TC Bear real life version from the Mascots in Real Life uh, 
series and one of my photos that I captured of a uh, brown bear at the Bronx Zoo. And these are photos where, uh, are pieces of artwork rather, where I combine stadium photography with um, player cards. So the ones on the top left and top right are from my Yesterday and Today series. That's Bush 3. Of course, Stan Musial never played at Bush 3, but he's a Cardinal through and through, and that's their current ballpark. And then the one on the right is Doc Gooden and City Fields. Um, Doc Gooden played at Shea, not at City, but if you're a Mets fan, you think it's kind of cool. Um, bottom right is uh, Cal Ripken, just outside of Oriole Park at Camden Yards, where the retired numbers are. Manny Machado in Petco Park, uh, Mookie Betts and uh, Dodger Stadium. And then that Yankee piece is uh, Yankee Home Run Kings piece that I created just after Aaron Judge broke Roger Maris's record. So that's uh, Babe Ruth with 60, Maris with 61 and Aaron Judge with 62. And the backdrop is a photo that I took at the inaugural opening day of New Yankee Stadium. And uh, lastly, these are some pieces that I created where somebody said, hey, can you do a Roberto Clemente piece for me? Well, unfortunately, I never got to see Clemente play. Um, I could have done PNC Park and a Clemente card, but interestingly, also not far from my house, a bit farther than Hinchliffe, but not far from my house, is um, in Branchbrook Park, which, side note, has the largest collection of Japanese cherry blossom trees in the country, larger than Washington, D.C., and in the spring, it's absolutely glorious there. And in the midst of all of those beautiful cherry blossoms um, is a series of five baseball fields, one named for Ray Dandridge, one named for Roberto Clemente Jr., one named for Rick Cerrone. And just outside the entrance to the park where those fields are is a replica of the Clemente statue that's at PNC Park. Um, it's rather large, not as large as the one at PNC. And that's what you see there. Um, the one on the right there, somebody asked me if I could do a Sandberg piece. And I happened to be in Chicago at the time that I was asked if I could do it. And I said, well, I could do Wrigley. And they're like, well, how about the Sandberg statue? I said, it's not there yet. It's coming in 2024. And so they said, can you do his plaque from the Cubs Hall of Fame? And I said, that's what you want. Absolutely, I can do that. So I created that piece. And um, the backdrop on that one kind of represents um, the shape of the uh, fly the W, right? Not the same colors, but the shape. And then there's a little uh, rhino silhouette there for his nickname that I created using one of my rhino photos. Um, this is Ozzy Smith outside of uh, Bush. And then Yogi Berra outside the Yogi Berra Museum and Learning Center. Sure. Um, there are a couple of instances where either I've been asked to uh, use, uh, something use something other than a Ginter card. card. In this case, In this that's case, the Yogi that's Berra stamp, 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 stamp um, that was stamp, released yeah. a couple of years ago. I've also done a couple oh, using yeah. patches or cut out felt um, coasters for, I, I was asked to do Jason Dominguez piece. And he's not even in the majors yet. So I was able to get a felt coaster from the team he was playing with at the time that was about a quarter of an inch thick and cut that and use that on there. So just all different ways that I use artwork to share my love of the game. And um, I hope you've enjoyed my presentation. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Donna. It's, it's just fantastic. And um, I love my piece and it's very substantial. It's like just so beautifully made. Thank you. I wish, it was I wish people could see it. Yeah, it's like just very cool and very well made. Thank you. I mean, every piece 
comes with a certificate, an embossed certificate of authenticity, and um, it's. It, I just I love, and the commissions for me are more fun than the pieces that I just make and put out there for sale. Um, because, um, because I, I know that they already have a home and, and that they're, they mean something to, to somebody. Yeah. And so thank you very much for, for commissioning a piece. Absolutely. And do you have any Kelsey Whitmore artwork coming? I haven't made any Kelsey pieces yet, but I am going to, um, after the holidays, I'm going to actually try to do a Kelsey piece. Um, the, the, the issue there is I need to get creative with what I'm going to pair with the photo because there aren't any, um, the fairy hawks don't have patches available. She's not on a Ginter yet. She's on, the Leaf has Kelsey Whitmore cards, but when you take a photo and put it with a photo, it, it just, it doesn't work for the aesthetic that I like to have. Um, so I was able to get my hands on some magnets that have the team logo on them and but they're not team logo magnets so i need to cut and i have to find the right tools to be able to cut through those magnets but i am hoping to do kelsey pieces yes excellent yeah thank you any other questions or about card collecting or we didn't even get it we, we don't even have time for that like you're doing <laughs> so donna has been on the rob nyer show you've been you've been in a lot of places. So we really appreciate your time and your fantastic presentation. Um, uh, Donna's also going to be, she's she's done already done one uh, thing with the New England chapter and they're actually doing part two on Tuesday. So if anybody wants to attend that, if you want more Donna, um, I'll, I'll be there. I can't get enough Donna, I guess. So uh, <laughs> yeah, so so they actually split you up. Yeah. So um, because, yeah. yeah, just your baseball life in general is kind of fascinating too so uh Thank you, any sir. other questions yeah did you um just since donna and i kind of share the yankees um bobby mercer was one of my favorites along with mel stottlemyre although that was after mickey of course but did you become a fan during the horace clark era which i kind of look back on fondly i i am I became a fan in 1970. That was so one of my favorite was, years. So I was I was yeah. born in 68 and we came back. Um, I was born in Puerto Rico. My dad was in the service. Um, and um, we came back to Brooklyn and in um, May of 70, and that's when I was introduced to baseball. So Bobby Mercer was my first favorite player. And, that's one of my uh, favorite teams because that's, after they was down, they even challenged the Orioles for a while that year. And I have the fondest memories of that team. I, I, that ballpark is hands down my favorite ballpark of all time i'll take the steel beams i'll take it all i loved that place absolutely mm -hmm. loved that place it's great you get to see the stadium before it was ruined by george steinbrenner <laughs> um in the 70s yeah it, it, the the 70s ballpark did have a good amount of charm to it though i mm -hmm. i will say i don't love the fact that the facade no longer surrounded the stadium. That is right. the one thing that I like about the new Yankee stadium that they brought that back. Um, but if you sat in the lower part of the upper deck at that stadium, it was, you were practically on top of the field and sitting behind home plate in the lower part of the upper deck, which is where I was fortunate enough to sit for the last game there. Um, it was, it was just absolutely beautiful. Yeah. It, it, you know, not as beautiful as the original place, but it, it, again, knowing what the history was and so on and so forth, the vibe of the place was just fantastic. Not the and, same as the original, but. Right, right. But to yeah. the Yankees credit, you um, there's like a little league field. Am I correct? And that 
where the original Yankee Stadium stood. So there, I, yes, I remember being three, It's really cool that you can be yeah. there. Yeah, there's three little league fields over there, um, as well as a piece <laughs> of that facade that was in the outfield behind the bleachers in what what in my family we call Yankee Stadium too. Right. 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 So really used to call it new Yankee stadium. Right. But now it's not. So it's Yankee stadium too. Uh, Donna, can you, can you pick a number between one and 13? Two be able to 14. Uh, the number, yeah, I, I would have picked 14 if we had 14. <laughs> I know. Right. <laughs> right. That, that's predictable. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, a number between one and 13. I am going to go with eight for Yogi Berra. Uh, okay. Jim Williams wins the, uh, this is the set of the card. Yeah. Very nice. Thank you. Congratulations, Jim. Jim. Congratulations. Thank you. And Jim, my uh, my email address is up on the screen here now. Um, if you want to shoot me an email with your mailing address, I will get that card set out to you probably this weekend. All right. Very good. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you, Donna, for doing that. You're welcome. Yeah, the, car the cards are very cool. And they're what I like about them is they're pre-renovation. So yeah. I'll pinch live. Yeah. And we, I, we didn't know, right? I mean, I, I would have done, I would have done the 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 pre renovation set anyway, um, but I was like, well, this is what it is. We're gonna work with what we have to get the story out there, and um, I may do a I may do a post set. I may. Oh, I may. We'll see. Cool. Something to look forward to. Yeah. Before, um, I, I don't know if anybody else has any questions, just a couple of announcements. I, I mentioned uh, Donna will be with the New England chapter on Tuesday. Um, just a tip of the cap to Minnie Minosio, um, whose 100th birthday is today. Wow. So happy birthday to Minnie. Yeah. Couple um, of, uh, you mentioned, mentioned your book, book club. Yeah, I was going, and that's another thing I was going to mention. Uh, our next book club meeting is December seventh, next Thursday. So sorry, we're a little tight on the meetings, but that's just the way it worked out. But this book is super fun. Um, it's called "The One Hundred Most Important Players in Baseball History." So it's another countdown book, but this one is different in that it's not necessarily the one hundred best players. It's the one hundred most important players to baseball society um it includes women um it's just so some of the players are well known um some of them not so much so i thought it was a really super fun read lincoln Mitch lincoln mitchell is a fascinating person he's a columbia university professor um he's kind of a, an expert on international affairs um but besides that he's just a big baseball fan and he's very comfortable using stats but also just little store I mean we love stories so just the stories are great little nuggets that um I didn't know maybe you didn't know either so um I highly recommend it um if you want to get the book I think it's available on Amazon or Barnes and Noble our local book bookstore Boswell Books um it's been on back order forever so Barnes and Noble or Amazon or you can wait till the meeting we are auctioning yep. A copy of the book so um, if you want to wait till the meeting um, otherwise it's it would make a great gift so um and just speaking of book club uh, a couple of years ago i think we had uh luke eplin's book our team so if we're talking about satchel page and larry doby this is one of my favorite books i mean maybe because it's like satchel page <laughs> bill Vec, um who are three of my absolute faves but uh just a fantastic fantastically written book about the 1948 Cleveland Indians. So even if you're not a fan of the Cleveland Indians, I recommend it. So um, so I think that's all of my announcements. Yeah. I've got two more. Okay. Um, don't forget the holiday baseball get together locally on Saturday the 9th of December, two o'clock at J&B's. We're just going to talk baseball and stuff. So and then on the 13th, 
we're having author Zach Ford of the book uh, Call Up talking about the Call Up story. And uh, that sounds very interesting to me. Mm -hmm. I heard it's a good one. Yeah. yeah. Also, I want to mention that on, um, let's see, Sunday, December 10th, the uh, Old Time Baseball Association of Wisconsin is honoring Bob Biggie. So we have four events in yeah. one week. <coughs> yep. Flurry of activity. Yeah, I'm definitely going to be there. Is anybody else going to the Old Timers? I will. I will. I'll see you there. Yeah. Yeah.